Okay, hey there, do-gooders. Uh, you are joined by me, of course, um, the writer, author, founder, doing everything <laughs> of the court order dot space. Uh, my name is Courtney Gore. I am an attorney. I'm an advocate, social impact, passionate person, um, and I'm Auntie Coco to my favorite, most perfect niece in the world. I feel so very blessed because with us today is someone who is the champion and pioneer of social impact work, uh, but she's also in so many other areas and we're gonna hear so much about her work. We're gonna hear more about what social impact is, but I'd like to introduce Ms. Masa Saba Brown. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, 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 it's <laughs> nice to be here. We're well, happy to have you. Yes, absolutely. I'm so excited to speak with you. Oh, thank you for your time. A little bit for those who may not know Ms. Brown. Let me let me clue you in a little bit, okay? So Ms. Brown is a social impact strategist. Uh, she is an advocate for mental health with years of experience, right? And working with youth and working on the front lines of mental health, okay? So she took her work on the front lines of mental health and working with youth and she she's degreed up everyone please understand <laughs> the girl went to school okay oh, okay oh listen the student loans we can we just have a moment of silence for whatever they're trying to do with these loans i mm -hmm. nevertheless educated miss brown is um she got her associates degree at morgan state university miss brown should i say the illustrious Morgan State yes. University. Yes, okay. yes, we can. Got to mm -hmm. represent. Got to represent. She yeah. went on to the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, 804. I'm an 804 yeah. girl myself, but she got her bachelor's in psychology. And then she went on to George Mason University and she got her master's in education. Um, along with all of this wonderful work and, and all of her studies, she actually created her own 501C Three. So not only is she putting in the time, not only is she putting in the work in the community, uh, she created My Menta. Uh, it is a 501c3 and a social enterprise that connects multicultural millennials to therapy that is accessible, therapy that is affordable, and therapy that is aligned. And so if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, I'll put the link to mymenta.co below. And if you're watching this on the web, on, on the court order blog, I'll also put the link so you can see more about her work. Um, so everyone here is there. I don't know. You have to be living under a rock to not know about the luxury brand, the house that is Hanifa, right? <laughs> I think the breakout moment was that fashion show. I believe it was 2020. Yeah. Uh, stand out. We're all in the house. Everyone is fearful of COVID. There's no vaccine. Fashion week was not a thing. People had just given up and people get on Twitter and they see this revolutionary, innovative fashion show. And the world, for those who weren't already in the know, learned about the art and beauty and the textiles and talent of Hanifa. So how does this relate to social impact and Miss Brown's work? Well, Believe it or not, they have a social impact department. And who leads that? That's right, our girl, Ms. Brown here. And so she is focused on community engagement in, in a time where just everything seems to be going wrong in society. She decides to see the good and do the good. So Ms. Brown, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Yeah. Oh. Hearing all that, I'm like, wow, it's, a, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's like an out-of-body experience. Like, wait, is she talking about me or somebody else? It's awesome. <laughs> thank you for that. Of course, and thank you for doing the work. So before we get into your thoughts, right, on this, what is social impact and, you know, everything that you do, I'd love to do a little fast round real quick, okay? Let's go, right. Let's go. yes. Okay, so the thing is, you have to answer the questions quickly. First thing that yes. comes to your mind. Okay, so we'll start with some easy ones. Yeah, okay. you're like, let me let me fix my hair. <laughs> yes. What is your your favorite color? Uh, turquoise blue. Mm, that's very specific. Oh, I like that though. Turquoise blue. Gmail or, out, Gmail or Outlook? Gmail, definitely okay. more accessible. Okay, listen. Uh, even even with the applications. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> winter or summer? You know, I'm going to go winter because I have a February birthday. It's it's uh, chilly, layers, but I also love fall. So I'm a little mixed in between, but the colder months, the colder months. I was not expecting that. And I think it's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right? Instagram or TikTok? Instagram. Yeah, I'm old school. Even if I'm old school, but... Yeah, I haven't adapted yet. You know, I'm making my way there, but I'm actually a Twitter head, so I know that's all the way out there. <laughs> I know. I was going to say, Twitter is a whole different ball game. I don't think I blame you, but if you're rating, okay, if you rate the three apps, you have TikTok, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram. We will leave Facebook alone right now, but of those three, rate them for me. Um, On a scale of one to five? Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or just put them in order. Um. Okay, so we'll say... Instagram first. I'm going to have to just, I was going to say Twitter, but let me just be real. Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, TikTok. And to be honest, that could really change in the next year. You may talk to me later and I'll say TikTok. It looks like things are changing that way. So things are changing everywhere. It's wild, right? Even when you get on Instagram, when we first started Instagram, it's a completely different application. Absolutely. It's yeah. wild. Okay. Virtual meetings or in-person meetings? Hmm. Uh, in person. Okay. Yeah. Tell me more. Um, I've enjoyed, you know, having tech and talking and things, but I think that's just my preference because I'm more of an extroverted people to people in person mm -hmm. and seeing body language, feeling the energy, all that stuff. So I'm going to have to say that, um, for real at my core, but I'm uh -huh. like, well, I've done virtual, but okay. it's in person. I feel you and I love it. Extroverts need to unite because we're the minority. I'm yes. learning. Yes. 100%. <laughs> I mean, where are we? And then this uh, last question, big community projects mm. or small scale projects? Mm. Yeah, I actually want to say both. And this is okay. why um, I believe they both serve a purpose and you have to be adaptable to using both. And it's very dependable on your mission, your vision, your goals that you have for your, you know, project, your company. So um, both, but if I had to choose where I've gone in my work, I will say it's much more macro, but it started out micro. So take that with what, but yeah. Yeah, the, no, that's a really great perspective. And it kind of leads me to my next question here for you. Um, you've done so much work. If anyone were to go to your LinkedIn or go to my Menta, just to get more information, it seems like you've touched and led and studied everything. Um, and you've really honed in, though, on areas where you want to serve the community. And you're very passionate about that. What inspired you and motivated you to decide I'm going to enter the world of impact. Mm, yeah. You know, for me, I think about um, purpose and I also think about faith first. I am a Christian. I'm a believer. And I'm always thinking about what is it that the Lord wants me to do? What is it that he set out for me? Um, and I look at a lot of patterns. So Every role I've had, um, a lot of experiences I've had, always have to do with people. I've always been human-centered, people-centered. Um, I've never been one to just be behind a computer. Even if I was, I'd be picking my head up, like talking to somebody, even if I'm not supposed to. I've actually started out as a kid getting in trouble because I used to talk too much. And that's usually what got me in a lot of, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, Have you asked, seen that beam recently where it was asking people for those out there who got talks too much on their report card? Yes. What do you do now? Yes. And I liked that post and I saved it. Yes. That's it. That's me. That's literally me. Um, and so, but for me, it's definitely been that it's been aligning purpose, faith, uh, my skill set, and then also seeing, um, where I fit, um, as far as where my personality is, where my background is and seeing how can I use that to help others. I've always been a service oriented person. Um, and that's all about social impact because you have to first learn how to serve before you can lead. And that's just my frame of mind for sure. 
I love that. You have to learn how to serve before you can lead. I think so many people could, I mean, there are plenty of seminars people can go to and plenty of panels people can go to if they want to learn more about social impact, but that's the root and foundation of good, efficient, meaningful work. So thank you for that quote. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. What was your first role? Because I think most people remember the most, like there's always a role that sticks out the most in their journey, right? Mm -hmm. There was always that one job or that one internship or that one apprenticeship opportunity that sticks out in their mind, mm -hmm. whether for good or for bad. Um, but for you, what was that first role uh, in this heart work? Yeah. Hard work. 100%. Um, AmeriCorps comes to mind for sure. I served back in 2011, a little further back, but I was in college, um, you know, just looking to get involved more in the college community in Richmond. And I learned about AmeriCorps being at VCU, which is where I went to school. And um, I said, you know what, I really want to try this and really see what I can do as far as uh, getting involved in the school system. So they were looking for tutors, they were looking for um, uh, good, really good, like, student leaders that would come in and just take it on. And when we talk about faith and purpose, when I got started with AmeriCorps, they assigned me to a school. And I lived across the street from that school did not know that that would happen so the great thing about it is being a college student i could just wake up like five minutes before my shift and just walk to work and then figure out my day absolutely um, <laughs> right but on the bigger picture of it i was like oh my goodness this this has to be there's no coincidence that it would happen this way um, I was still kind of late anyways, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, but you know, that experience was really my true first time seeing, uh, youth, um, from neighborhoods that were just really overlooked, not under-resourced, underprivileged coming into these class settings. And they're kind of like, uh, a mini, a mini representation of the areas that they came from. So you would see kids talking to each other about things going on in their neighborhoods, a lot of things, and it would kind of show itself in the classroom. So my job was to go in and take um, specific students that were identified as needing to catch up with their reading comprehension. So I went in, had my my little small group of kids, and we did like one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And it was just really in those moments where I, I truly understood how it takes everyone and honestly, you know, truly knowing that, um, that those kids that are in those situations, they just need someone that can understand them or try to understand them. And also uh, knowing that you wanna help them be better. And that was something I truly loved. I was, I was there for a year and I also had a chance to be in seminars where we would talk about Richmond, we would talk about um, the dynamics of the city and red zoning and how things were segregated, honestly. And so, I was always thinking about poverty. I was thinking about segregation. I was thinking about all these different dynamics going into the school and working with these kids. And so I worked as a person to represent something that they hadn't seen before. So something I would do, I would like talk about traveling. I would talk about reading. I would talk about uh, being proud of your skin and, and being um, open to others and things like that where these kids are coming from a very black and white mindset, mindset literally, and what they're seeing every day. So I just said that my choice was to make sure I showed up as something that they could one day maybe say, you know what? I remember that at that time they called me Miss G. I remember Miss G when she would come in with these books and we didn't really get it, but now being older, it makes some sense. So yeah, I'd have to say that that was really the first experience. And I love how you describe that because you planted so many seeds, right, in the with those children and you don't necessarily see the manifestation, you don't see the fruit yeah. of your labor, but you're okay with that if it means that there was some impact. Yeah. And I also love how you talked about just in that one role, right, that amazing role with AmeriCorps that you sought out, shout out to AmeriCorps, I was also in AmeriCorps, 
great opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, but you made that role more expansive. You took on that role and you identified not just an opportunity to tutor people and children academically, but to also show representation and demonstration, to also uh, have conversations surrounding inclusion and to also encourage students to understand cultural, right, appreciation. And so you made that role expansive, which again leads to my next question, what is social impact to you? And so before Ms. Brown answers this question, I know a lot of people come to this channel or come to my website, or maybe they're even on LinkedIn and they keep seeing this new, ambiguous, really strange industry that's labeled social impact, right? Some people think it's corporate philanthropy. So money going from the powers that be to what organizations, causes, and persons doing the good work. Some people think of it as ethics, right? Creating standards within their companies that don't exploit other communities, that don't exploit or ruin, right? The environment <laughs> uh, or don't put their own employees in a place of destitution or violate labor laws. Um, and then other people see it as creating visibility for other great people doing great work or bringing awareness unfortunately, to causes that are terrible. And so mm -hmm. social impact is that, but even more, there's so many other areas and it's it's growing, it's developing, and there are more postings about it. But to you personally in your work, because you are a social impact pioneer here in this industry, Ms. Brown, what would you say is really, so what is social impact to you? Yeah, oh man, I love that. And even the lead up, it's so real and so honest because we're all still trying to figure this all out. Even I will say I'm trying to still figure this all out. Um, I think what social impact means to me now was uh, is different than what it was before. So before, to me, it meant you know coming from a nonprofit, understanding a nonprofit background. It was literally saying, you know what, this is just a new term for nonprofit work. That's how I saw it. I just saw it as wait a minute, we're talking about resources and disadvantaged, you know, individuals, communities. That's been going on in the nonprofit space. Like that's been the thing. Um, but as I've come to learn a little bit more, um, it also talks about the uh, responsibility that companies and businesses and the for-profit world now also has to making the world better. So it's always been on the shoulders of the nonprofit to do and care about, but now we're evolving into saying, wait a minute, it actually is beyond that. It takes also um, companies that are, you know, putting out things for profit, but also now having to think about what can we do to be purposeful? What can we do to help um, communities as well, to be sustainable, et cetera. So there's definitely that a part of it. Um, and then even where my, where I sit, I look at um, intersection. So that's a lot of talk and diversity, equity, and inclusion. I look at that in social impact as well as a whole, because coming into it, you got to understand where your intersection is. You can't just say, I'm in social impact. Okay, social impact and what? <laughs> like, what's next after that? What's that thing that aligns to it? So I like to look at where I, where I play or where I kind of sit is between that partnerships and community engagement part. Um, and even mental health, where it's definitely thinking about the community, but also finding ways that partners can be brought together to drive really great uh, um, changes, projects, campaigns, and then community engagement, uh, talking to the piece about centering those that are closest to the issue, making sure that they have a voice, making sure that they're heard, and that they're a part of the decision making. And then the mental health part of it is just honestly, I mean, it goes without saying, this is not optional. We have to be very conscious about our um, our capacity to be in community with each other. We got to think about our wellness. We got to think about um, our own experiences that we bring into these places and how to really do it all together. So that's what I think about with social impact. And I think it's in a very exciting place right now. I think it's a good time to be thinking about this and being involved with it. And it's something that it's here to stay and I don't see it going anywhere <laughs> for the foreseeable future. 
Absolutely. It's needed more than ever. And I know it's so cheesy to say that out loud because everyone says that now more than ever, now more than any time we need. But it's true, right? And so I love what you said, though, about the fact that a lot of this work has been and continues to be on nonprofits. That's the reality, right? And so while some of these great corporations and organizations are giving corporations are giving the money to nonprofits or highlighting nonprofits, the work is still on them. And so for you, you've been able to work in corporate spaces, nonprofits, some I think also I, I think we talked about, you know, you in government spaces at some point mm -hmm. or another here. What would you say or, or how do you get people, especially if you're in the corporate space, mm -hmm. to want to buy in to what it is that you're putting forth, right? You have your organization, you have your cause that mm -hmm. you say, hey, let's really focus on black boys and mental health or, hey, let's really try our best to focus on creating community events for children on the weekends or children who need lunches, whatever it may be, how is it that you say this is the cause or this is the organization and really get someone to buy into that? Absolutely, I love that question. Um, a couple things come to mind. One, what comes to mind is that we have to look at what's the landscape of the world right now. Um, in the next, now we're in 2023, they're saying by 2040, 2050, one in five people will be of mixed race, of color. Um, that even might be a low, a low statistic now. I think it's probably even increased. But the moral of that is that how we look in our country is about to be much more diverse and inclusive. And a lot of these traditionally, you know, I'll say white spaces that have been in place for hundreds of years are now having to realize we can't do business the same way we've done it, where we've, you know, reserved certain things just for the top, for those that look like the same. We now need to be much more open, much more inclusive. So that as a wide scale is going on. Then you also factor in, of course, um, the movements that are happening, all of the different movements, right? Not just the Black Lives Matter movement, but gender movements and, um, you know, just so many movements are going on. That has increased. The pandemic that we all have experienced and then the police brutality that we all have seen. So there's just things actually happening um, in our country. And then, you know, that doesn't even touch on the world, but, you know, on a global scale as well, as well um, you know, we're so much more connected with our social media and we're talking about things, we're sharing things with each other. So on a big scale, this is a, um, this is where we are. And so when you bring it down a little bit more to, um, you know, why companies need to think about it, well, your workforce is gonna start looking a lot differently. And you need people in those leadership positions that are going to represent that. Not only that, but the communities that you're wanting to support. If you don't have black and brown people talking to other black and brown people, you just kind of have an echo chamber where you feel like you're somewhat getting the message, but it's not being felt. And you have to have a balance. You gotta have those people in the room. So that's a piece of it. And then also, a lot of people are starting to get this social impact thing going, whether it's, you know, starting small, whether bringing in one consultant or, you know, one person to lead it. Um, but people are starting to build departments. Um, some companies have always had a CSR department, but now they're rethinking how they do it. They're starting to say ESG. They're starting to say sustainability. So as a business, recognizing the landscape, things are changing. How are you adapting? How are you also evolving with the change that is happening now? And then lastly, I would also say um, is that um, with social impact, this has great, uh, and there's research to prove that not only diversifying your people um, can help your business, but also having a social impact lens helps your business, your revenue, um, your bottom line. So it's also strategic. And it also can help you bring in um, revenue in a new way. We have this, this generation coming in, Gen Z and after, that have already said that companies that they support, they want to see that they have some type of environmental, social cause right out the gate. Like they're not holding back. Um, and so you got to think about that. You got to think, how are you also getting prepared 
for those young people that will soon be working in your company and seeing and wanting to see um, those kind of things. So, um, and, and there's and there's also other things where employees right now, they're already talking about ways that they can volunteer. People do it in their time outside of work. So it's thinking about how to tap into what people truly care about and bring it now into the workplace. So I could go on and on, but that's kind of what I think about. Listen, if I was the vice president of a corporation right now, I would literally just, I would be in awe and I would be compelled or more compelled to buy in, right? Because you touched on different areas. One, of course, the biggest thing is gonna be revenue, right? Of course, you want revenue, you want good marketing and you don't wanna wait until your consumers are saying, what are you gonna do about this? Or what's your stance on this? Or how is it that the money is being donated or what's happening internally? You want to be on the preventative side to say we are already a morally good company. Right. We're already in front of this, um, whether it be, and I know this sounds terrible, we want effective work, but we also want that to be visible and well known by consumers. Mm-hmm. So that was an incredible answer. I want to ask a question that might be a bit invasive, but um, the reality is that most new industries, especially industries on the cor- in the corporate realm, are dominated not by people who look like us. Right. Um, those opportunities are largely reserved for people in leadership roles who might work with minorities, who might work with immigrant populations, who might work with the impoverished, who might be with those who are houseless, but they have never experienced or felt the scrutiny, right, of, of that weight um, and being in those demographics. and. So for you, being on the other end, uh, how is it that you've been able to navigate this social impact space as a Black woman? Yes. Yeah, let's definitely. That's a question. It's loaded, but. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So a few things I think of. Um, You know, when I got into this space, I went in already knowing that It wasn't going to be easy, but from the lens of knowing what the need is and what people truly are suffering with and how to actually speak up to that, how to best represent that. That's actually one of the things I used to think about a whole lot is, am I communicating well what I'm seeing, you know, living outside of DC or being in Richmond? Am I really representing that? Am I going back to AmeriCorps? Am I bringing in Um, the concerns of those kids to the leaders that I work to. And am I doing it right? Am I doing it well? Am I being a good advocate um, is the word for sure. Um, So as a Black woman now, thinking about that, really coming to an understanding of, you know, I truly, truly have to scale it back and understand where I need to also take space for myself and make sure that I'm in the best place to do that. You cannot pour from an empty well. So I've had to be very conscious about my capacity and what I'm able to do and just what I can. And so another part of that is really being clear about um, what do I care about the most? Because I care about a lot of things. Like I care about prison reform. I care about social justice. I care about, um, you know, uh, youth development. I care about abuse. So I care about so many things. But in social impact, you got to get super clear about where can I truly plant my feet and just hit it from the ground running and really just make that impact there and maybe expand along the way. So that's another part of it. Um, but in these different spaces, definitely in the last two years or so i'm seeing there's a lot of oh my goodness like we just came out of this this reckoning and everyone's talking about race we're talking about white supremacy culture we're talking about um you know police brutality all that stuff now it's a bit of what can i do what can i do what can i do um instead of hey what am i doing right now that i could do differently so companies really looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, okay, we're not really doing um, this all the way, or it seems like we are. A lot of performativeness has come up where you feel like you're being supported. You feel like you have an advocate, but when it really hits um, the fan, I don't want to cuss, but when it really hits, it's like, oh, wait, there's a disconnect. And I think about, you know, going a little political, not too much. I think about this past uh, primary election, and I was on Twitter and I was checking out some of the statistics for Georgia. 
Um, and, you know, we were all, you know, praying for Stacey Abrams to get in there. It didn't happen. But when you break down and disaggregate the data, looking at her support, you know, there was some some key things showing there. And it showed that there was definitely a disconnect between um, some of the black and brown voters and some of the white voters. And to me, it was really eye-opening because, you know, I hear so much of, um, you know, what, what can I do? How can I be involved? And then you give out ways to do it. You say, you show these great women leaders to support, but then they don't get supported. They don't get in these, in these places. And you're just like, why? So for me, I'm, I'm always in a place of like, being conscious, I'm always aware. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an intuitive type of person. So I kind of know who's being genuine and I kind of know who's not. And I just try to stick more to those that truly uh, want to do good and they want to see change and really try to lift up those people. And, the, and they're white allies. Absolutely. There's allies in every culture. And so trying to focus more on those people, the people that do uh, back up what they say and work for those people and work with those people and collaborate with those people and really give them an opportunity to be involved. Um, so that's some of the things I've seen. And then, you know, personally for me, I've totally always come across some of the like, you know, microaggressions like, wow, didn't know you spoke so clearly and oh my goodness, you know, yeah, I actually had that. That was maybe two years ago, crazy. Um, got on a call and I heard that like, wow, I didn't know you could speak so so eloquently. Um, oh yeah, and that happens so much. So what I need to decide in those moments is how do I respond to that? How do, how do I react to that um, in a way that I'm not going out of my comfort zone because sometimes these things are triggers and they can lead you to doing things that aren't uh, uh, pro produce it or conducive to your mental well-being. Um, but also finding opportunities to go back and say, hey, I didn't appreciate that. Um, this is how that felt for me. Please be mindful of it moving forward and being very confident and assertive in that sense. Um, so it's something that I've definitely had to work through and continue to do. Um, and also not feeling confined. You know, we talk about diversity and you notice a lot of the time it's black faces, but I grew up, the way I grew up, I grew up with a lot of different cultures um, around me. And so I think about multiple people. I think about different types of people at that table, but I'm going to always go for, for my folks first. I'm going to always try to come in with, hey, we, you know, what, what, what are we doing with my people? That's where I go to. And then I'm like, hey, but what about our other brothers and sisters that we also need to bring along the way? So that's kind of some of the things I think about. That's incredible. And I want to just, I mean, at the visceral shock in my face, not <laughs> shock, but, you know, reckoning with the, you speak so articulately. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's just so demeaning, but it's it's right. It, it, I mean, you're not only trying to do your job in connecting, right, and building and, and helping the community. You also have to reckon with the fact that you may be the only and with the being the only comes a lot <laughs> and so that's a difficulty within itself and you gave some really great practices to implement um the sermon right is this worth the addressing right now or do i address this later in another format so we can focus on getting the project done for the community it's 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 a real battle. <laughs> yeah, and you navigated it, obviously, very gracefully. I want to ask you, um, so you probably get asked to be a mentor a lot. Um, I know for me, I'm a professor at the University of District of Columbia. And so my students and then former students or other students within the school, you know, once they go on, they want mentors that connect them. They always want me to be the mentor and I'm happy to, but you know, capacity, like you said, self-preservation is key. So um, for you though, um, if you were to put all those people who have come up to you and said, would you be my mentor? Or for those who have come up to you and said, my daughter is really interested in the work you do. Would you consider mentoring her? Um, if you could put all those people in a town hall and just give them solid advice what would be at the top of your agenda because i know you have a full one but <laughs> at this current time <laughs> what comes to mind for for that group 
Yeah, I love that question. And it comes at such a good time because I just had an opportunity to be at a session specifically for college women. Um, uh, actually, women that were leaders, established leaders were talking to college women and giving them advice. And one of the things I said um, for me is, is that you got to really understand where your alignment is and really just go after it. So knowing very clearly what your path looks like and being okay if it's not what you thought it would be, if other people thought is what it would be, um, how does it feel for you? How does it line up? And how are you able to be uh, successful and just really move in that boldly is what I tell anybody that I would mentor um, because you get a lot of the imposter syndrome thing. You get a lot of like, um, indecisive and all those things. And I always find that common link of people just not feeling all the way sure about going in that way. And I would just say, go, go, go and do it. And if you're the only one, um, you may feel that, but you will along the way find others that also feel like they're the only one and y'all can come together and, you know, lean on each other and support one another, which I will honestly say, even meeting you, Courtney, I feel like that is already something that's building between us. So, um, you know, even here we're showing an example of that. So I would always say that to the young person is do your thing, be yourself and do not let up on the gas. <laughs> 100%. That's fantastic because honestly, you've already demonstrated that right earlier in this, in our conversation, you talked and you said, I'm interested in a lot of things, right? I mean, I, I love, and I want to work in so many different areas, but the reality is you have a home, you have a family, <laughs> you have your own life that you have to maintain and your own self-preservation. And so being aligned and finding what causes you really can do the most good in and that align with what your current journey is, is important. And that's important for people who are so motivated by passion or motivated by, you know, seeing and making change. Um, Cause oftentimes, I don't know about you, and I get this feeling from you, but I was the one in college who signed up for every student organization. Listen, <laughs> yes. Grades Preaching just fire. a suffering. Grades just a suffering, but I'm out here in NAACP. I'm out here in the public health organization. Yep. I'm over here mentoring young girls after school and tutoring them. And then I'm in like another cultural awareness organization. And so, you know, but it's because you're multifaceted in your passions and obsessed with seeing good work. And so alignment is key um, and that comes with time. Can I ask you in, in your toughest times, because these times are tough, right? Um, yes. What is it that you rely on? What is it that gets you through those dark moments where you say, you know what? I don't have to do this. I could go and get a nice, cushy, comfortable job that I close my laptop at five. And, you know, I could make TikToks or Instagram reels about hashtag soft life. And right. <laughs> I right. mean, I, I could be doing this. Um, yeah. What keeps you in heart work? You yeah. Know, what, what keeps you there? Yeah. Um, and listen, I'm all about that soft life too. So let's, let's go ahead and acknowledge, listen, I love it. I'm like, Yes, it is the life for me. But uh, yeah, I, I always, I always say, you know, it's, it's the words that always come to me is faith, faith, hope, and also possibility. Those are some words that come up um, because, and you know what, at, to add on to that, I also think about um, what am I being equipped with to now do for someone else? I think about that actually probably more, um, these days, because we often think that the skill sets that we have, the experiences we have is to build our own resume, which is true, but you also got to take it a step further and say, what is this all coming down to? Who am I supposed to be helping out and bringing along the way um, and, and supporting? And that's what I think of. Um, and that happens in those moments where I'm like, man, you know, am I even doing this? Why should I do this? And then I think about, but who is that person that could use or get some help from what I need to be doing? And me by and by me sitting back on that, 
how am I helping improving uh, to improve their life? I don't know why I can get the words out, but pretty much that, like how to ensure that I'm not in the way of uh, uh, sharing a blessing that I've received and imparting that onto somebody else and them also taking that and imparting it to somebody else and it just continuing after that. And so I never want to be the hold up. I don't want to be the person that's like, hey, like you're the enemy of progress. What are you doing over there? You got to get going. Um, so I think about that. I think about what is my personal impact and how that can do uh, good or bad to somebody else's situation. And I think that's really important to think about um, even when you're in social impacts, what are you doing? Um, you know, you have your intentions, but being really, really clear about um, how does that impact the person on the receiving end and how do they experience that? Um, so that's what I think about. That's real. Yeah. That is extremely <laughs> raw and authentic there, right? Because um, oftentimes, even in work based in social impact and in the community, um, it's easy to get caught up in being not egotistical, but sometimes we have a little bit of a complex, right? A savior complex where it feels good to always be the one giving. And it's good to bring ourselves back to why we started. You said faith, hope, possibility, purpose are kind of the things that I'm hearing and bringing yourself back to who are we serving? What are we serving is really, really important. I love that answer. I know you have so much going on, um, so I only have a few more questions, but I want to know for you, what is there, is there any, someone who wants to follow you, someone who wants to see what's, what you're up to, because you give really great presentations to corporations. I know you just did one for a really well-known women-aligned organization that we see everywhere. I, um, but if someone wanted to see what are you up to, maybe not in your personal life, but in your work, where can they go? And beyond that, are there any events or causes that you want to highlight right now? Oh, good. Yes, I love yeah. that. Um, so I'm right now, I am just hot on LinkedIn. I don't know what it is. I'm all over that algorithm. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Masa Saba Brown. Um, you know, I'm frequently engaging, finding ways to just, um, you know, share things, like things. Um, I also on there have a pretty new group, which is called Sisters in Social Impact, um, which we just started in the last month, um, which is just an opportunity for honestly, for me where I was at trying to find other people like me that were in this work trying to break in or currently doing it and just wanted to get real, wanting to get real and find others that could just be open to conversation, to connecting, supporting each other, um, specifically for black and brown women in this space. I just said, we got to do it. We got to get this thing going. So I've been definitely on there. So please also look out for Sisters in Social Impact. If you are yourself a young professional, you know, a veteran professional, um, and you just want to be a part of this, please, please come and join. We just got it started. Um, and then other than that, um, I'm also on Instagram. I have my Menta on there, which is my mental health nonprofit. Uh, we are considering a little TikTok movement, so it may not be as engaging right now. Yeah, we're, we're thinking about it because the people are there. The young people are there. We got to go. We got to go where the people are. So we're thinking about it. <laughs> you got to do it. Listen, do TikTok, it. I, I, I am a, I'm a Twitter girl, too. Right. <laughs> to be determined, but I am a tick tock fiend. I, I had to put the timer on to make sure I don't spend my entire morning or day on it. But yes, yes that's fantastic. Yes. So right now you're beefing up some more my Minta content. Yes, absolutely. I'm I'm definitely, you know, thinking of some 2023 ways we can beef it up on there, but it's definitely in the conversation. Um, you can also, you know, stay tuned to um, Hanifa, which is a, you know, amazing luxury brand, um, of course, near and dear to me. Um, just check out Hanifa Dream, which is the new social impact apartment that's being pulled together um, to just really create some good things down the line um, and to really just continue to push for more equitable solutions for um, for women that truly need it, um, for sure. And then I say, you know, uh, another area definitely to engage. Um, I'm actually based out of the DC area. Um, I talked earlier about being in person and meeting people. So I'm always up for a coffee. I'm always up for a chat. Courtney knows we, we, we did all that. 
Um, so, you know, if there's a way to like get in touch with me, I'm more than open to that. I love to exchange ideas and talk through things. Um, so just on that note, I'm always down for that. I'm in the DMV. So if you're based out here, you want to get a social impact, let's connect. Um, and then as far as what's upcoming, um, so I do have a very, uh, really, really good conversation that's coming up with a couple of other really good social impact leaders. Um, they're in the, it's in the works right now, but the thinking is to have it come out. Uh, December of this year, 2022, right before Christmas. Um, and it's going to be an opportunity for social impact leaders to just talk and also, um, as, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Acknowledge some of the things I've talked about in our talk tonight. So diversity and social impact. And then also, um, you know, which I didn't even get to touch on as much, but just how tricky and how there's a lot of layers to really get into social impact. Um, how, you know, you may not be able to find the resources. You kind of got to dig for it. You got to talk to people. You got to do all that. So the other piece of it is going to be about um, how to have a one-stop shop, how to really come and, and find just all the social impact things in one place, because right now it's kind of scattered all over. Um, so um, there's some people that are starting to pull that together. And that's something that I'm going to be looking forward to as well. Um, and Courtney, you'll know all about it. It's coming out very, very soon. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, so that's some that's some exciting things. And then in 2023, um, definitely going going to definitely looking to go deeper with uh, Sisters in Social Impact, um, trying to get like a nice meetup together and just bring the women in one place and just fellowship and have have some really, really good connecting. And then um, looking into the longer 2023 year, um, just continue going deeper in social impact, CSR. Um, you know, I'm always open to opportunities to speak, to meet, to, um, you know, learn about ways that I can share with others. So I'm always open to that as well. So, yeah. I love that. And I'm, I'm here to everyone who is watching. I'm here to confirm, okay, everything that she is saying. I remember sometimes you go, especially to virtual, you attend the virtual events or you go to events and you meet people and they'll say, oh yeah, let's grab coffee or yeah, let's grab drinks. Or, and then you can never get in contact with them ever again. It was just obviously a formality, especially if you weren't, you know, the lead of social impact of Paramount Pictures or, or at HBO Max or I don't know, Target. If you weren't that, some people really just kind of you know, push you to the side, but Saba is serious. She said, okay, let's do it. And, and we did, and she does, does the same with a lot of, a lot of women. She's trying to mobilize and she is mobilizing. It's not trying, she is uh, mobilizing and making sure that, that these opportunities are available because anyone who is in social impact knows there is not a cookie cutter step a or guarantee to getting into this field or getting a position in this field. People come from so many different walks, paths, and journeys. So I'm here for that. If you're, again, if you're watching the YouTube, some of these links that she mentioned, for example, her LinkedIn, and possibly uh, if you're interested in joining the Sisters in Social Impact, follow her, send her a message, because it is really great to see, oh, so many like-minded women who are one, trying to help and support each other, but two, who are willing to say, hey, have y'all seen this job? Anyone who's interested, maybe you should consider. That's and right. there's there's no backbiting or competition. Yes. So, and that speaks to you, Masa, for putting that kind of atmosphere and environment together. One last question before we part ways, because there's so many ways for people just to understand your work and who you are, but when all is said and done, if you decide to, if this is America, right? <laughs> if you decide to collect on retirement, to close your laptop for the last time, even though I know that's not going to happen, <laughs> you're going to turn 60 and you're like, I'm going to start my own foundation now. And <laughs> okay. I'm still going to have three other positions that I'm working on. And, you know, I, I you're always going to be at the center of it. But, you know, when you're concluded and you're done with this work, what is it that you want the world to know about or remember about you uh, as the social impact professional? Like, mm. What do you want your stamp to be in this industry that's growing and developing? I love that. That is That talks to legacy and that is that's everything. We are trying to leave behind something for the next 
and the next and the next and the next. So, you know, I, it's very simple for me. It's where I go to is how did I make the best use of what I had to work with and really, really um, do my very best in that. Um, And I say it from that perspective because this kind of work is work where you do not have everything laid out for you. You don't have the, the roadmap all the time. You don't have sometimes the income all the time, sometimes the resources and everything like that. And so trying to think of a more solution and um, uh, uh, what's the mindset, not a scarcity mindset, but abundance mindset. How did I work with what I had to still improve the lives of others? And how did I do that um, given whatever I was in and whatever I, I was a part of? And that's for me really key. Um, and that even speaks to my faith, right? You know, being a Christian, um, and and following Jesus Christ, you know, you don't always have the answers. Sometimes you don't always understand why you are in certain things and why, you know, there's certain lessons being taught. And so the more that you can have that faith and saying, you know what, I don't really get this and I don't really see everything happening, but I'm choosing to move boldly with what I have and what I do know and and with the blessings that I do have. And it also ties into gratitude, being grateful, um, even recognizing when you're not at the place you wanna be, but just saying, you know what, God, thank you. Thank you for where I'm at. Thank you for where you're gonna take me and thank you for what you've done all this time and being okay with that and finding peace with that um, is what I would say. Yes. That is beautiful. That's beautiful. And how how can you refute, you know, the purpose? You know, how can you refute what it is that God has for you? The faith part is something that I think all of us who were working and enjoying our jobs casually before the pandemic were faced with, right? Why am I doing this? Because so much hit at once. And so yeah. that's fantastic. I want to thank you so much for joining this conversation today. If you're interested and want to get in contact with this wonderful beacon of light, uh, you can, of course, look for her on LinkedIn. There'll be links underneath this, in the description of this YouTube video and also on my website. Uh, make sure you continue to check in with the court order dot space for more conversations and opportunities, right, and social impact because we really do want to unpack and see people um, who are doing the work and ask the question, what is your impact? So thank you all and uh, be well. <laughs> Be blessed. Thank you so much, Courtney. Of course.